Hello, my name is Melvin Poor, and I'm the tuba player with the Ensemble Musikfabrique and I'm happy to be here to present my first video in the small series, that's Studio Musikfabrique Online Learning. Today I'm going to talk about vocalized tones, mostly, but first of all I'm going to say one or two things um, about the whole series and about the instrument. First of all, we have an instrument here which is a very silent beast until I bring myself to the tuba and start to do something with my lips. Until I get into this position and start flowing through the instrument, then we're two quite separate bodies. But as we bring these two, th two contact points together, then suddenly we become one unit. And as a, uh, uh, one composer uh, has written in a piece, Tom Johnson wrote in a piece uh, called Monologue for Tuba, I need my tuba and my tuba needs me. Without that, the whole system can't function. It's very important that I use the word system there because we, uh, we learn as we go along that when we change something in the system, that something else in the system probably will change as well and we have to adapt as we go. So everything that we change will cause something else to change. The thing about uh, changing is uh, we're coming to that very quickly because this uh, lip read here can be replaced by something else. It can be replaced by my voice, for example, or it can be replaced by, let's try some of these things here, a bassoon read. Or it can be replaced by a saxophone mouthpiece. tuba bell with a contrabass bow. In that case we don't need anything at the front end of the instrument at all. Sometimes we're also asked to play things like this, which doesn't use the tuba at all, but it uses the tubist. So we're looking at a, a whole bunch of new sounds which we are required as tubists in new music to be able to play. And it's very important that we practice these sounds and the techniques involved in producing the sounds. We integrate them into our everyday practice and bring them into the concert hall with us. So many of these sounds are actually very different to traditional tuba technique and it's important for us as contemporary musicians to be able to produce these sounds in as good a way as possible and we need to practice them a lot we need to become aware of how we're producing the sounds and i can only encourage you to become aware of what you're doing with your body in order to produce those sounds and look very very carefully observe very carefully what is happening how you can you might improve what you're doing and so that you can also identify when something goes wrong wrong of its own accord without you which probably means that you are not paying attention to it and that you need to pay attention to it again so many of these sounds and techniques i will cover in later tutorials uh, as i said today we're looking mostly at vocalized sounds so the vocalized tones are actually uh, nothing new. It's something which is very important for contemporary music. It's part of standard brass technique these days, but it's actually a very old technique, which as Marco Blau in his video has told us, goes back 
several thousand years, uh, particularly to the instrument called the Yadaki, an instrument of the Australian First Peoples. And uh, a lot of people play that instrument these days. And it it's interesting that the instrument in our culture, in Western European culture, that is most close to the Yudaki, the modern instrument, the trombone, is really very close to the Yudaki. It's a long tube, basically, and it has very few bends in it. And you can treat it in a way very much like the Yudaki, singing and playing. <coughs> uh, we've taken over the technique, of course, for all brass instruments, and uh, that's what we're going to look at now. Now, although we're talking about new music, contemporary music, the vocalized tone that comes most often is actually the open fifth, a very traditional, perfect fifth. <laughs> playing an open B flat on the tuba and I'm singing an F now if you've never done this yet then you should do it immediately <laughs> and don't worry at all about how it sounds just get used to the feeling of singing and playing at the same time. <coughs> However you like, yeah? You can also just go... <coughs> and through working on it, you begin to understand what function your lips are doing, which part of the sound your lips are controlling and which part of the sound your voice is controlling and how you can work them independently of each other. The other thing is I would like to show you how this, these two tones are combining because there are some elements in these tones which are not in the tone that I'm singing and not in the tone that I'm making with the lips. They're being brought into the tone by a modulation between the two components and you can actually hear it in the fifth if your reprodu reproduction uh, on your computer is good enough you would be able to hear that note up there sing some other notes so that you can really hear clearly the components which are being generated by the intermodulation. exercises that we can do which will help us to get some independence between the voice and the, uh, the lip read tone. First one is like this, what I've already done actually, holding one tone and moving the voice. staying within a relatively small range but of course the idea is to increase your range as you go and uh, we can go up further and we can also cross the tone that we're blo uh, blowing as well Glissando rather than individual tones, first of all. Mm -hmm. 
so that you don't have to keep turning on the vocal, uh, the vocal fold. <coughs> the other way around, of course, we have to do it as well. So we're going to hold the vocal tone now. <laughs> This is a little more difficult because you have to be very well in control of the embouchure, but uh, that is a question of practice and it helps, really helps to increase the independence of the voice and the blown sounds. <coughs> so the next exercise is one that we all know and love from <laughs> learning our instruments, practicing it for years probably. It's the expanding uh, the all interval expanding exercise. Uh, this one. <laughs> becomes more difficult because you have to jump with two tone producers. <coughs> uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect fifth. You can do it with, let's say, a major third. to to look at now before I close is the changes that happen as the notes become closer together you've probably noticed it already mm. and at the latest there when there's just a major second between the two tones then you hear that there's some kind of beating going on. It gets very granular. If I make it just a semitone, then uh, the beating becomes less frequent. And if I get to a unison, This is a result of the, actually they're called resultant tones, which are happening, those we heard before. And in this case, they're getting so, the one is getting so slow that you only hear it beating away below the threshold of our hearing. <laughs> that it becomes more difficult to play when that is happening and so that is a point where you have to pay special attention to keeping both of the oscillators here under control <laughs> the octave 
They went up from a unison to an octave. And a similar thing happens there. So the second harmonic is, uh, is vibrating, is beating against the harmonics of the vocal tone. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much for being with me. I will come again and uh, I will talk about this saxophone mouthpiece, bassoon mouthpiece, maybe one or two other little things. We'll see. I hope to see you then. Bye.